This video is sponsored by Raycon. Click the link in the description for up to 20% off your order. F1 has, with some regularity, changed up the program. Be it with modifications to the rules, the structure of the weekend, resource allowances, or the very nature of events themselves, Formula 1 is not a sport that has ever stayed static. And on the whole, this has been a good thing. Whereas in, say, football, where a lot of the variables have remained pretty much the same, just the set number of humans kicking a polyhedron around a rectangle, the very nature of Formula 1 shifts significantly, with evolution in technology, economics, business, and its impact beyond the racetrack. As such, the sporting masters must regularly confront the very meaning of F1. What do we want it to be? What are the meaningful parts of F1? What do we need to keep? And what needs changing? What path do we want to send F1 on over the next handful of years? As F1 is changing constantly anyway with research and the progression of both technology and the nature of operating such large operations, it's easy for the sport to have these moments of self-reflection and interfere with its own evolution. But while F1 has introduced changes and modifications fairly often, what it has rarely done until quite recently is experiment. The most obvious example to consider is sprint qualifying. F1 didn't just change the entire format of the weekend across all of 2021 as it has done many times before, instead they introduced it as a trial across the British, Italian and Brazilian Grand Prix so they could see how it went. This itself is quite radical for the sport and it was actually quite restrained in its application. All three weekend formats were identical. They didn't try different versions of the sprint to see which might work best. They barely gave points for success, just three, two, and one for the top three. And they didn't dare do any kind of reverse grid shenanigans between quali, the sprint, or the race, lest they be accused of meddling too hard or punishing success for the sake of entertainment. And this, despite a healthy reverse grid format working for many years in formulas two and one across their weekends. There was a tentativeness with messing with the purity of an F1 weekend. This itself put F1 into a bit of a bind with regards to the pole sitter title. Would it be more messy to give it to the winner of Friday qualifying? Which would match the current feel for what the pole winner is, even if that person wouldn't sit on pole come Sunday. Or give it to the winner of the sprint, despite them not necessarily doing the best hot lap in a quali scenario. A bit of an expectation for the pole position record. In reality, the record of pole position holder always goes to the driver who sits on pole come the start of the race, regardless of any qualifying that might have gone on. Penalties have seen a fair few quality winners denied pole position, but this felt even more of a disconnect than usual. As it's played out so far, sprint qualifying has had a tepid reception with only a very slight favour towards it among fans according to this year's global fan survey, and they definitely don't want to see it at every race. But what's important is that fans, competitors and the F1 overlords got to see how this would all play out in reality and make decisions of what happened using real world data. F1 has twice in the last two decades introduced quality systems that fell on their faces immediately. One was aggregate qualifying in 2005 where a single lap quality was run on Saturday and Sunday with the times from both added together. This really took the wind out of Saturday's session and made Sundays much harder to follow, and that's if you could watch it at all. Lots of stations simply didn't show it live in the tricky Sunday morning slot. And 2016's elimination qualifying saw the slowest driver eliminated every 90 seconds, but failed completely because obviously drivers can't improve their times as quickly as they were being eliminated, so the whole session ended in a horrible anti-climax. And I guess you could call both of these quality formats involuntary experiments as they lasted just six races and two races respectively before being switched back to a more familiar setting. The pandemic also formed more of this involuntary experimentation as if one needed to adapt to trying circumstances to get the show back on the road and keep it there. The deputising of Imola strained the turnaround time from the race before in Portugal so they squeezed the event into just two days, something that got F1 thinking more about how to utilise its weekend structure more effectively. This is the spark that led to trying sprint qualifying and to the new adjusted weekend structure for 2022 with a more optimised three day run. We have also seen a lot of old and new tracks sub in to fill the calendar to quite a bit of excitement and popularity leading to thoughts about how perhaps the F1 season can become a mixture of permanent fixtures and rotating venues, a way to fit the 30 plus tracks into a 23 race schedule. And this is something I'm all for. 
To simplify logistics, Pirelli had to give teams identical spreads of tyre compounds each weekend instead of the teams being allowed to nominate their own choice of tyres. There's no reason this can't continue if it helps the logistical side of things, it hasn't had a noticeable impact on the competition. And it actually allows F1 to try further experiments in this area. For example, Ross Braun is looking to reduce the number of tyre sets available to each team at some races in 2022 to see how that unfolds. Obviously this is being done in consultation with Pirelli so they can make it workable, but it's a good idea to try it out in a planned, thought out way so they can evaluate its impact and make data driven decisions about future seasons. And I think that's one of the keys here. Experiments in a planned, considered way with everything on the table up front could be an effective way to introduce ideas into the mix. You have a better understanding of how things will play out, get to see any surprising side effects and consequences, and then evaluate from there. You also get to analyse feedback from the competitors and the audience. Of course, feedback is problematic in itself. Teams will naturally favour solutions that benefit them personally over the objective needs of the wider sport. Not that they're completely selfish entities, but they're not saints and without bias. And fans? Well, fans are the trickiest of all. Social media is a reactionary hellscape where everyone is mad at something and the majority of angry voices yell far louder than the largely quiet and content. And people hate change. Sometimes because they hate any tiptoe away from the golden age of F1, which is whatever year they started watching, and sometimes because we are creatures resistant to mixing up the things we know, even if it's for its own good. So F1 has to analyse, filter and consider fan feedback in a larger context. They noticed, for example, that hardcore fans that railed against sprint races watched them anyway, because of course they did. While at the same time those sprint races intrigued newer, greener fans to tune in on Saturdays. Now, this is a net win ratings-wise. Now, this isn't the be-all and end-all of what makes them good, of course, but the media landscape is ever-changing and F1 as an entertainment package needs to understand how to meet and grow an audience in the new world of competing shows and interests. It can't cling to its oldest fans forever, as Bernie Eccleston would have preferred. And experimentation is a way to do this. If we can try out ideas that might have legs, why shouldn't we? We have 23 weekends worth of space in which to do it. Next year, Sprint race formats will apparently be run six times with an evolution of this year's system. They're looking at expanding the points maybe to cover the top eight or ten finishes for example. Now I personally would go further and use those six slots to maybe try three different versions of the sprint including a reverse grid trial. But I understand they don't want to shake the boat too hard while we all understand the impact of the new 2022 car. And we can't expect F1 of all things to be too radical can we? And whatever they do, all the teams should know about it in advance of the season. They should know which races will have sprints, which will have reduced tyre sets, which will have, I don't know, forced two-stop races or whatever they want to try. The point is it should all be on the table before race one so all teams are on the same foot. One thing I didn't like about this year's implementation of sprints was that their places on the calendar were revealed throughout the year and I don't think any changes should be introduced once we've got going and we have a feel for the order of competition. You know, maybe it's clear having a sprint race in Brazil benefits Mercedes more than Red Bull. I'm not saying it does, but messing with things once you know how they might impact the competition is messy. I'd rather it was all organised blind-ish before we have a feel for it. So yes, I'm in favour of F1 trying new things. I think it should always be considering what might make a more interesting competition, within reason. F1 is an entertainment after all, and some ways of organising a competition are far more engaging than others. And sometimes a motorsport outgrows its format. Formula One has pushed at the calendar length for years and should use this extra space and time it's bought itself to be thoughtful in introducing new concepts to the table. Not throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, but genuinely trialling its best new innovations. We can do this effectively without confusing or deterring its audience. In fact, quite the opposite, as by experimenting, it brings viewers into the process. And from there, it can build and develop its already effective package for years to come. And I've got to thank Raycon for sponsoring this video. I've been using their everyday earbuds a lot lately. I do a lot of walking to visit friends, cross town, generally keep sane. And you know what? They're great. Honestly, I've really been enjoying using them. They're comfy in the air, which I can't say for all earbuds. They've got this rubber oil look and feel with gel tip so they just fit gently but snugly. 
I even gave them the shake test to make sure they wouldn't fly out, but... <laughs> don't wear glasses doing this. They paired really quickly and easily with my phone straight out of the box and they slot away all snug in their little container thing when you're done, which then charges them when they're sitting in your pocket. Very cool. And that gives you a whole 32 hours of battery life with eight hours of playtime. And of course they got the microphone built in so you can take calls and they start at just half the price of other premium brands. And if you're not delighted, you've still got a 45 day guarantee. I do absolutely recommend them to you. And if you click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash chainbear, you can unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off a Raycon order. You'll get yourself some lovely earbuds and you'll be supporting the channel too. Wins for everyone.